So, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be back in Dublin again. Um, yes, Arizona State University is going to be opening up its courses to um, people without qualifications to be able to study online. So, welcome to the club. The OU has been doing that for 40 years now. So, that's who we are. We're the, the largest university in the UK, the 14th largest in the world, 180,000 students, um, 1,100 academic staff. It's important to say that right from the start we've been a research active university and uh, we do, as you know, research into online learning but also research in many other areas. You've probably heard about the Rosetta, Comet, uh, the Rosetta Space Mission that landed on the comet. There was um, equipment there that was designed by the Open University Space Sciences Group. So we do a wide range of research. Um, and our approach is supported open learning. So all of the learners who take degree courses at the Open University get uh, a local tutor who, in small groups, uh, they can work together with that local tutor, um, either online with them or face-to-face -face meetings with them. So it's the approach of not just um, learning online, but also having tutorial support. And there are 7,000 associate lecturers uh, tutors um, around the country and some of them abroad. But um, about two and a half years ago we were posed the question can we open learning at even more massive scale? And when MOOCs came along um, the OU was somewhat complacent about this because we were doing that already. We've got the relationship with the BBC where there's 250 million views a year of uh, Open University branded BBC programs in conjunction with uh, online materials and then leading on to OU courses. 66 million downloads from iTunes U and we have our own um, open learning site called OpenLearn with 5 million registered learners. So when MOOCs came along, as I say, we were pretty complacent that we're doing that already. And the UK uh, Minister for Higher Education went off to Stanford and came back and immediately got off the plane, got on the phone to Martin Bean, the Vice-Chancellor, and said, OK, you may be doing it, but you're not doing it in the same way as they are in the US. Um, you haven't got this thing called MOOCs. And so the Vice-Chancellor was stung into action. And to his credit, he immediately set up uh, an operation uh, which was originally called Project Kylo. For obscure reasons, a Kylo was a, as a sort of um, highland cattle, so, as in moo, mooks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Project Kylo morphed into this thing called FutureLearn, which is a separate company. Um, so it was set up as a for-profit company by the Open University, but with the profits being reinvested back into the company. For very good reasons. The Open University has got a lot of strengths, but uh, ag being agile isn't one of them. Um, and it would have taken a long time to, uh, within the OU to, to set up that operation. So he set it up as a separate company. And within um, six months of being set up, we had staff and we had a platform and we were starting to develop our first courses. So that was quite an achievement. Um, so um, that's where it is now. So FutureLearn now has 130 courses from 51 partners with a broad range of business, health, science and arts. So it's not science focused as some of the other platforms. We developed from scratch um, a new uh, online responsive platform so that it provides access not just on desktop but also on tablets and on mobile phones. And 25% of people who access FutureLearn courses now do it on mobile devices. One of the big debates we had early on was should we put FutureLearn on Moodle? Um, because Moodle was the Open University platform uh, to the IT department in the Open University, Moodle was the obvious thing. We, we were the biggest user of Moodle in the world, so you just extend Moodle for uh, future learn courses. And there was a great debate about whether we should, you know, it didn't seem sensible to IT uh, in the Open University that we would go off and build another platform. But there were a number of reasons to do it. One is that Moodle just doesn't scale up to a um, million or more people. 
uh, and FutureLearn now has just over a million um, registered learners. And it just doesn't scale. With FutureLearn, the platform we've built, as we get more people, we just spin up more servers. Um, it, it's a web-based, cloud-based platform in the way that Moodle wasn't. Um, and it's responsive, that it was built from the start for mobile access. And particularly, and this is what I'm going to be talking about, it was designed around a different pedagogy, a different approach to teaching and learning. And the other thing to say is that we're particularly pleased that, about the demographics, that 60% um, female uh, learners on the FutureLearn platform, which is, again, different demographics to some of the other US platforms. Those are the partners currently in the UK, and those are the overseas partners. So we now have 19 academic partners outside the, U the UK, and that's growing rapidly. Um, there's been a new course just started this week from Yonsei University on um, uh, Korean and Chinese history, which is really excellent um, from an American um, who's based in Yonsei University and is a kind of star academic and he has a really compelling history of China and Korea. So it's become an international operation. And the cultural partners. Future Learn is based in the British Library, which is a great place to work. Um, twice a week I go into that beautiful building. Uh, and then the British Council, who put on the most successful course so far with 120,000 learners uh, on exploring English, and the British Museum. So those are some of the cultural partners um, of Future Learn. So what I want to talk about primarily is how do we design successive, successful massive open courses. So if you go back two years ago, we had this huge opportunity, and as a learning technologist, it's a kind of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If you've been for the last 30 years, as I have, designing technology that, if you're lucky, gets used by a class of 30 children or possibly 100 people in a museum, the opportunity to design a new platform for a million people, it's a kind of learning technologist dream. But then the reality hits you, which is, okay, so how do you design it? You know, what do you base it on? And that was what we were confronted with about two years ago. Um, so these were the sort of background. We knew it probably wasn't going to be Moodle. Um, there was the initial C MOOCs, the Connectivist MOOCs, and then the X MOOCs, so the MOOCs based on instructional design and de um, delivery of video material. We wanted to develop a design that was informed by the best theory and practice of pedagogy, of teaching, learning, and assessment. But it had to work at massive scale. It had to be scalable up to a million or more people learning online. So you couldn't do the open universities supported open learning. You couldn't give 20 people a, a personal tutor. And there was a team from BBC Digital. So um, that's the other aspect of FutureLearn, which is that the CEO of FutureLearn came from the BBC, and he brought, understandably, a number of his BBC friends with him. So there was this BBC culture. So there was an interesting sort of clash of cultures between the OU Open Access and the BBC, particularly in terms of the production value. You know, the BBC is committed to the highest quality production value. Now, the OU's teaching materials are pretty good quality, but we weren't making BBC TV programs. So there was this, and still is, this interesting tension. And it had to be implemented in six months. So we had to not just design a platform, but we actually had to build it and get the courses started within six months. So it was quite a challenge. So where do you start? Well, here's one starting point. You may know of the work of John Hattie, um, who produced a, an amazing achievement. It's a synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses related to achievement in learning. And if you haven't read his book, Visible Learning, I really do suggest you look at it. So he um, did a survey, not just of 800 um, st uh, studies of learning, but 800 meta-studies of learning, and looked at what is it that makes learning successful. Uh, mainly at school level, things like class sizes, for example, or um, the charisma of the teacher, but also um, different pedagogies. And what he concluded, and why it's called visible learning, is that the, one of the main aspects that make for successful learning is uh, making the learning visible. 
What's most important is that teaching is visible to the student and that learning is visible to the teacher. The more the student becomes a teacher and the more the teacher becomes a learner, the more successful are the outcomes. So that was one basic principle, to try and make the learning uh, visible both to the educator and to the learner. Then there's this paper um, in 2000 um, in the, uh, the journal magazine Science called Foundations for a New Science of Learning. And what that um, seminal paper concluded was a key component is the role of the social in learning. What makes social interaction such a powerful catalyst for learning? That paper ended with the question, what is it that makes social such a powerful catalyst for learning? And so these were some of the principles that we started with when we were developing FutureLearn. Visible learning and goal setting. Um, so making clear um, the educator's goals. So what is it that the course is about? What's the big question that the course is trying to address? And also help the learners to make clear their goals. Provide reputation and reward so that as you go through the course, you can see how well you're doing and get rewarded for that. Collaborative learning, enabling people to work along with other people and to see um, the other people who are uh, collaborators, who are co-learners. And to try and get away from online learning being a rather lonely experience. So again, if you go onto some of the other platforms, you, you go on there and you watch the video, you do the quiz, but you don't get the feel that you're learning along with thousands of other people. To provide review and feedback so that you can give timely feedback on a learner's progress through a formative assessment and mastery learning. So learning towards uh, the to mastery, towards developing your competencies and empowering educators. So allowing the people who are running the course to have con not just analytics at the end of the course but continuing analyt analytics as to how the course is progressing. And do that at a massive scale. So scaling learning. Um, some educational methods get worse when you try to scale them. So you think of sports coaching, for example. That if you're tennis coaching, then you know, it works for two people. Um, not much better when you go larger than that. Football coaching, you know, 11, 15 people. But they don't scale. Other sorts of ed educational methods are pretty much the same depending on scale. So I'm lecturing to you now. Um, it's being videoed. There'll be people who will be watching later online. It's pretty much the same experience. Whether you're watching online, whether there's a hundred of you, a thousand of you, it's pretty much the same experience. Which is why XMOOCs worked, which is that it's pretty impervious to scale, um, lecturing and testing. But which educational methods get better with scale? So one way to start with um, addressing that question is Metcalfe's law. Um, so Metcalfe um, in uh, 2007 produced a paper in Forbes based on other work, which is basically quite simple, that there are some network systems which the larger they get, the better they get. So the telephone system is an obvious one. When you had the first two telephones in the world, it was no, great to talk to one other person, but it wasn't much use beyond that. As the telephone system expanded, particularly as you had international subscriber dialing, it got better. There were technical challenges as to how you could manage this complexity, which is why dial codes and international codes and subscriber dialing came in and so on. But from the user, the more phones there were, the better the experience or the better the possibilities. So for some network systems, the value of a product or service increases with the number of people using it. But, of course, we're not just points in a network. We're not just passing data to each other. We're human beings trying to learn along with other people. So networks enable learning if they support productive conversations, conversations that are new, important, timely, understandable, appropriate, and trusted. In other words, we want to develop effective social networks for learning, human networks for learning, not just passing data. And also, one other wrinkle on that is that for, if you've got a two-sided network, then both sides need to benefit. And in this case, we've got learners and we've got educators, and both of them 
need to benefit. Learners need an opportunity to learn. Educators need an opportunity to teach. Learners need ease of use. Educators need to manage that complexity of a million people learning together. Um, and learners need value that increases with scale. Educators need to gain insight from that massive scale data. So you need to have a system that benefits both sides. And so what did we, how did we develop it? Well, we, I decided uh, as academic <coughs> lead to base it on a theory of learning at scale and learning as conversation. So the idea that all learning is a process of conversation. And that goes back to the work of Gordon Pask in the 1970s and more recently Diana Lorillard, the idea of conversational framework. Now, I could say lots of things about Gordon Pask. He was a fascinating person. He came at learning and education from a different perspective to people like Skinner and the sort of instructional scientists. He came at it from a cybernetic perspective. And he saw learning as a, as a cybernetic system, a system that is continually interacting and evolving. And he said that all learning, and this is important, all learning is conversation. We converse with ourselves as we come to try and understand the world, making distinctions, black, white, big, small, democratic, not democratic. We, we continually try to understand the world by holding internal conversations about the world that we're experiencing. But we also hold conversations with other people, with partners. That partner may be another learner, or it may be somebody more knowledgeable, or it may be a trained educator. So there are many different kinds of conversations, and they're conversations around things. They're not conversations in abstract. So you have conversations at the level of actions where you are conversing about um, uh, um, uh, information that you're being given, about models that you're uh, playing with or exploring, or problems that you're trying to solve. So you have these action-directed conversations and you have conversations at the level of description where you're trying to understand not just what it is you're doing but also how and why you are learning. So this is a space of learning as conversations. What was interesting is Pask was also an educational technologist. In fact, he was the, probably the first educational technologist um, and he built built the first adaptive training system, for example. And so this is an implementable model. It's not just an, a theoretical abstract model of learning. So when I showed this to the software team, many of whom had been um, recruited from the BBC, this was the first model of learning that they got, they understood. They said, OK, we've got to try and then build these things. We've got to try and build this here, this shared medium. We've got to try and support these sorts of conversations. So then how do you build that? Well, one of the things is that you don't want to just have conversations in the abstract. You want to have conversations that are linked to what it is that you're trying to do, conversations in context. Um, and you want to separate out the more abstract conversations, the more <coughs> reflective conversations from the conversations for action. And you want to make distinctions between learners and partners. And you want to be able to manage the complexity of that learning system. So in brief, how can you enable effective conversations for learning at levels of action about the things that you're doing and description about concepts for hundreds of thousands of people from many cultures? Because this is a scalable model that the more people who take part, the richer the conversations. The more partners you have from different perspectives, different backgrounds, the more opportunity you then have to come to know through sharing those different perspectives. So would it would that work in, theory, in practice? That's a, you know, a theory of learning. Would it actually work in practice? Well, this is a future learn platform. And uh, I was passing around some leaflets there. I, you can go onto it yourself. You can browse the courses. So that's what the front page looks like. And let me just give you one example of a course. So this is a course called Introduction to Forensic Science from the University of Strathclyde. Uh, in Glasgow. And it's for people who have got a vague interest in forensic science. They've probably seen CSI or one of those other TV programs and think they might want to be a forensic scientist because it's an exciting thing to do. You know, you get to look at 
murder scenes and uh, you get to use interesting forensic techniques, but they don't really know what it's about. So that's what this course is aimed at. Now, partly because of the uh, involvement of people from the BBC, the other aspect that they were interested in was storytelling. So how can you create a course that's not just a, a series of disconnected videos, but how it can tell a story, how there can be an underlying narrative. And this is probably the best example of that. The whole course is based on a narrative, and the narrative uh, is around a murder a murder that took place, a real murder, in the 1980s. Somebody was murdered in his car. And uh, each week you get a video which is a reenactment of that bit of the murder. And each week you have to try and use a different forensic technique to try and solve the murder. Um, so you might use footprint analysis to look at the footprints around, blood sample analysis, and you're encouraged to um, take blood samples of, of your own blood and do the analysis. But you're not doing this on your own. You're doing this with thousands of other people who are also trying to solve this murder together. So this is what the to-do um, page. So this is your top-level view and again, this goes back to John Hattie's work on visible learning, making the course visible at a glance. So you can see that this is a six-week course. The course is actually up to week five. Um, but as a learner, you can go back and look at earlier materials. So here I am in week two, and I've actually only completed half of week one. So I'm well behind with the course. Uh, I've gone into week two, and I've completed half of week one. And week two is about fingerprints and fingerprint analysis. So as I said... Um, part of it is based around this murder mystery, but also part of it is around active learning. So actively doing things. And one of the active things to do is taking your own fingerprints. Uh, and here you are. And then it shows you <coughs> step by step how to take your own fingerprints. So <coughs> you put a rubber pencil, <coughs> you put your finger onto the pencil, then onto some um, uh, sellotape, and you can get a lovely fingerprint on the sellotape. So you do that activity, and then you get the video sequence. Um, you watch the video. Um, I don't know whether I can... Can I show it here? Let's see. Could you think the marks of interest the passenger door and one on the driver's door? These were from the same person who had not shown either of the wars and were clean enough to suggest that they were of recent origin. The finger marks were compared to prints in the national database, and a match was found with unidentified marks from a scene investigated during an unsolved drug case. And so on. So you get um, information about what happened in that real murder, and then you get the opportunity to then discuss it with other people. So if you click on that uh, icon there, you get the discussion. And so we don't send learners off to a separate forum. Every discussion, and if you think back to the conversational framework, every discussion is in the context of the activity that you're trying to do. And it's a kind of water cooler discussion. It's a free-flowing discussion. And some um, of the learners get worried about this because if there's a thousand comments, how can you read through them all? Well, the answer is you don't any more than if you're having a chat at a conference, for example, or in a bar that you would try to engage in every conversation. Typically what you would do is you look at the most recent ones to see what other people are saying, and then you click on the most light. And the most light brings up the discussions, the contributions that other people have rated as being interesting. And also typically the educator, because the educator has a particular role in this, the educator will then comment on some of the most liked contributions, and so you will get the educator voice in there as well. So it's using social network techniques to try and manage the complexity of this massive scale interaction. Now when we designed the platform, we really didn't know whether people were going to contribute to these discussions. And it's been amazing in terms of the, the number of people who have taken part in these discussions and the, the richness of the discussion. So if you go down here, and this was pretty much a random page that I took, but just down at the bottom here, I clicked on this person, Rita Raymond. You can then go to 
that's the contribution that she made. Mr. Duggan gave the wrong address, which seems so contrary, and so on. So she's trying to solve this murder. You click on her name then, and you go to her profile. And all of the people on FutureLearn are the, the, it's their real names. We don't use aliases. Again, in part for trying to open up education. So you don't hide behind an alias. You use people's real names, and you get their real profiles as much as they want to give about um, which, well, which courses they take, but also their background. And you can see the other contributions that this person, Rita Raymond, has given. Not only to that course, interesting, but to the other courses she's taken as well. And then you can go on, if you want to, see a comment that she's made in some other course that she's taken. So you're following um, these threads, but not threads of a threaded discussion, but threads um, of interaction through people. So that's the, the conversational um, framework. And to give just one other example here, the most popular course so far, Exploring English, um, from the British Council, 120,000 learners took the course. Just one video had over 17,000 comments on it. So it's an amazing engagement of people with the course material. And half of the learners who started that course contributed to the discussions. So again, a far greater involvement of people in the online conversations than in other MOOC platforms from 178 countries. So that's the, the basis of the learning as conversation that's embedded into the FutureLearn platform. Um, what other sorts of learning activities can um, work at massive scale? Well, here are some of them. Um, in conversation, the, the bigger the scale, the more pers perspectives you can get, particularly as people come from other cultures, other backgrounds. Social network learning, so finding people to study with through following, liking profiles. Again, the more people who take part, the more opportunities there are to find people who are like you to study with. Peer review. Um, I'll mention just um, that as one other example of the way we've tried to develop a scalable approach to learning with FutureLearn. So the more people who um, take part in the course, the larger the pool of appropriate people to review your assignment. So on FutureLearn, we, we made a distinction between um, peer assessment and peer review. So where assessment, the purpose is to rate a, an assignment to give it a, a, a rating. Um, with peer review, it is to provide constructive comments, constructive feedback. And so the way that peer review works, and this is another course on Hamlet, um, that you're given a structured assignment, in this case to say what's your own prefer preferred version of the play, Hamlet and why, and you have to discuss a number of different versions of the play. You submit your assignment, and that assignment goes into a pool, then, uh, for other people to, uh, to review. And immediately you get back another assignment from that pool for you to review and to do a structured review, normally a three-part review. On FutureLearn, each element, which we call a step, a learning step, we try to keep to about 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes. So your assignment is designed to take about 20, 25 minutes. And then you get back another assignment, which you're asked to do a review, which again takes about 20 to 25 minutes. And then after about three to four hours, you start getting back reviews from other people. And the more reviews you do, the more reviews you get back. And typically, uh, learners do one to two reviews. So that's the way that peer review works as a, uh, an interactive process. There's more that we actually want to do with this so that the review can then be itself an element that you can have a conversation around with um, the other reviewers, and we haven't implemented that yet. Um, in fact, there's quite a lot we haven't implemented on FutureLearn, and I guess this is the main issue so far, that we've developed some very exciting approaches to pedagogy, but there's a lot more to be done. For instance, around small group discussions, around game-based learning, around inquiry learning, and looking at how each of these can be <coughs> scaled up to larger scale. So another area that I'm looking at is what's called citizen inquiry, bringing uh, aspects of citizen science, where you've got thousands of people involved in citizen science, along with inquiry learning. So that you're not only doing 
data analysis for scientists, but you're also initiating your own inquiries and recruiting other people in the kind of Kickstarter way of setting up an investigation and then bringing other people in to join that investigation. So there are other pedagogies that do work at massive scale, and that's one of the things that the Open University were actively exploring. So that's the pedagogy that underlines FutureLearn, underpins FutureLearn. Um, so we've implemented peer review, we've implemented discussions linked to content, both innovative and both successful, but there are many other things that we still want to do. I just want to say a little bit now about the other side of it. So you know, we're talking about this two-sided notion um, of, of networks. So it's got to benefit the learner, but it's also got to benefit the educator. Uh, so I want to say a little bit about learning analytics. Um, and in particular, insightful analytics. So uh, what you want is that what you, as a, an educator, not just to get back masses of data, you want to get back um, insight into what changes you can make to the course. So how you can improve the learning design based on the analytics. And in basically three sorts of analytics. Transactional who viewed what, when did they view it, on what sort of device. Interactional, how did they interact with the learning design. And conversational, so what, you know, uh, going back to the learning as conversation, what do they talk about, who are they connected to. So this is the top level analytics from FutureLearn. So if you look at the people who sign up for a course, well it's the same on every platform, about half of the people who sign up for a course actually start it. And that's, if you look at Coursera, edX, it's pretty much the same. And the reason for that is you can often be signing up two or three months in advance of the course, and uh, when the time comes, you're too busy to start. So it's one of the reasons that some of the other platforms now are looking towards on-demand courses, so that you start the course immediately, you sign up. Um, the problem there is, if you've got these rolling courses where you can just start the course whenever you want to, you haven't got the notion of a cohort moving through. You haven't got the notion of learning along with other people. So it's a kind of, it's a dilemma that we're just grappling with at the moment with Future Learn is how can you have the benefits of uh, signing up and starting immediately on a course, but also working along with a cohort of other learners. And it's something we're actively looking at. Then, of those, so all these other um, stats are in relation to learners. So of the people who start a course, 84% are active learners. And at FutureLearn, we, we can track who is an active learner because for each step of the course, you have to mark, you press a button to say that you've completed that step. Now it's up to you as a learner to decide what you mean by completed. Um, it could be you've just glanced at it and you're happy enough. It could be that you've engaged with it in depth. But you have to explicitly say that you've completed that step. And 84% who start a course mark at least one step as complete. 45% come back the next week. So the other way of looking at it is you lose about half the learners in the first week. Um, and that's, again, something that all of the platforms, but particularly you know, FutureLearn, we really want to try and uh, bring that numbers up. And for some courses, it is much higher, particularly those courses that have a strong narrative drive. Because if you've got a reason to be coming back the second week, um, for instance, if you want to carry on solving that murder mystery, then um, you, you're more likely to return. And we're looking at ways of taking people over that bridge from one week to the next with things like advanced organizers for the next week. 22% of those who start complete. That's a pretty good number, particularly, again, compared with some of the other platforms. And it differs wildly. We've got some courses where over 50% have completed the course. And what we're particularly pleased about is overall, um, about a third of the people participate socially. They join in the conversations. Now, almost everybody use the conversations, they learn vicariously from what other people are saying, but 37% um, overall take part in those discussions. Some other um, analytics, so we can look at what platforms people are working on and what time, so this is time of day, day of the week and platform. 
So you get some interesting things like there, um, there's a spike at about um, 10 o'clock at night of people who are accessing the FutureLearn platform on tablets. It's people taking their tablets to bed to carry on the course. Mm. You can ask questions, specific questions, like how long should a video be? Um, and because it's at massive scale, then you can get answers to those questions um, by doing the analytics. So each of these dots is a different video uh, on FutureLearn. And along the bottom here, along the x-axis, is a video, the length of the video. And some of them are 30 minutes or longer, some of them are very short. And up the y-axis is the percentage of people, not just who quit the video, but who quit the platform altogether. Um, so that's bad news. Uh, and up to about eight minutes, it's, it's around 20, 30 percent. As soon as you go higher than that, then you get people, um, many more people, higher percentage who are leaving the platform. So the answer to the question is about six to eight minutes is how long a video should be. And then I've mentioned about peer review. So these are some of the top level um, stats you can get from peer reviews. This is from a number of different peer reviews. The average length of an assignment, the average length of re review, number of hours to the first review. But again, you can drill down. Because you've got this analytics, then you can look in greater depth. So here, this is for one course. This is for one peer review. Uh, so each of these dots is a person, is a learner. And this is the number of minutes between submitting an assignment, sorry, between first viewing an assignment and submitting it. So it's up to 160, so it's up to about two and a half hours. So there's a rough correlation, but not a great one, between the length of the assignment and the longer it takes. But look at that person there. They've submitted a thousand word assignment in under a minute. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> So that's when you start to get suspicious. <laughs> How did they manage to submit a thousand word assignment in a minute? And well, the, ob <laughs> the answer is fairly obvious, they copied it. Um, and all of these ones down here, um, these are the suspicious ones because they're submitting long assignments in two or three minutes. And these ones down here are just typing rubbish. So we actually don't send these ones um, off to be reviewed because they're just you know, a few word gobbledygook. So you can start to do things on a platform to help the learning and help the reviewing, but also you can look in more depth about the learners themselves. So that's the sort of insights you can get from analytics now at massive scale and drilling right down to the individual learner. Another interesting one about the learning design, uh, at, after each peer review, we encourage the course then to have a discussion, the learning is conversation, for the learners to discuss their experience of doing that review. So how did you get on with the assignment? How did you get on with the review? What was it like for you? We find that 20% of the learners go to that discussion first before they do the assignment. In other words, they find out what other people are thinking about the assignment before they do it themselves. So they're not going in a linear progression through the course. So we're starting to find some things about the way in which people progress through the course as well. So to conclude, then how do we design successful open learning at massive scale? The answer is to develop pedagogies that get better, that improve with scale, particularly learning as conversation, social learning, connected with insightful analytics. Now when we first developed the FutureLearn platform, all of the, uh, the publicity was around both um, how great uh, these MOOC courses were, but also about how bad the pedagogy was, how it's just um, pushing videos at people about uh, the instructional design approach uh, coming from the US of video-led. And so taking a, taking a different approach of social learning was quite innovative at the time. <coughs> if we look now at the MOOC platforms, Iversity, um, right in the center now, their front pages discuss. And we know that Iversity has learned a lot from the FutureLearn platform in redesigning its learning platform. NovaWed now describes itself as the social online learning environment. And um, Coursera has just um, developed a completely new platform, which, interestingly enough, is based around visible learning, so that you can have uh, an overview of your course. And 
discussions associated with content. Um, so it's uh, many of the features of FutureLearn now are in Coursera's new platform, which is great. It's a, it's a great compliment that um, the, the, the approach of social learning and uh, learning as conversation is now appearing in some of the other platforms. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we do have a little bit of time for questions Good. because we are predictably sort of running a little bit over, but we'll catch up at some stage, probably over lunch. Um, Mike, the uh, first thing I just want to make a comment on is that when we were putting the uh, program together, uh, we really did want to address the mass pedagogy and the learnings that can come from MOOCs because of the a hyphen, some of the negativity around mm -hmm. MOOCs just mm -hmm. being, as you described right at the end, some traditional passive forms of pedagogy being pumped out of hype. Mm -hmm. So I think um, you've really achieved the goal that we had was to help people appreciate how future learning has led the way in being pedagogically driven around um, a framework, a very explicit framework. I can't help but avoid this. So I have to acknowledge, of course, my, um, that John Hattie's a fellow New Zealand. Yeah, so, um, he is indeed. Uh, now Melbourne, Melbourne, no, so we'll uh, ignore that for a minute, but with Diana Lorelei's conversational framework theory, um, the other element I think that's important to note is, of course, the history of new technologies in education is littered with people taking traditional models, traditional models of pedagogy, and applying them to new technologies, mm -hmm. which is effectively what we've seen with many of the other mm -hmm. platforms. So Future Learn stands out for that reason. And then the last point I just make before I open up for a few questions is I think the analytics that you shared in the last part of your presentation again underscores why we need to be engaging with the MOOC um, movement because the learnings, the lessons, are, I particularly took note of your um, data around the use of video. Um, I think there's a lot that can be taken from that. So that's just my little observation. Um, we've got five, probably five minutes of questions, I think. Who would like to start off? I found that an absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, last year I did a massive online um, learning course myself <coughs> on learning to teach online. Um, they used peer review, as you suggested there. It turned out that there were some quite difficult um, intercultural difficulties <laughs> in the way that operated. And I'm wondering if the Open University can start with that and how you manage it. So, that's interesting. What, what, what sorts of difficulties in terms of misunderstandings between... In, in terms of the fact that we were asked to make critical comments about other people's work, you know, yeah. positive and critical, yeah. and for some cultures doing that yeah. in the public forum wasn't seen to be okay. Yeah. So It's a, it's a big issue um, that you know, there are some cultures, Chinese culture for example, where it's not considered polite to criticize other people's work um, and uh, particularly not the work of uh, scholars but even the work of peers. It's not considered polite to do that. Um, I think there's two things. One is that we are trying to we're trying to engage people from different cultures and their different perspectives. So, uh, for example, in that Exploring English course, the first discussion was for people to discuss what their experience was of learning English, rather than just saying, this is how you learn English. So getting people to start from bringing in their perspectives. And as we've gone on developing more future learn courses, um, we've brought in more international partners and that's become even more important to try and understand and to not just understand but to celebrate and to engage people from their own cultural perspective. I don't think so all of the courses have done that necessarily well um, but uh, that's certainly something that we've tried to do. In terms of engagement of people from different cultures in things like the review process, I think it's very difficult. Because on the one hand, you can say, okay, we'll respect people's cultures. So, for instance, we won't have a peer review because it will be difficult or embarrassing or culturally uh, challenging for those people. On the other hand, we want to model, um, we're not trying to model it international education 
practices. We're trying to model, you know, we are a UK-based um, platform and we're trying to model the, the sort of um, UK-based uh, and European-based educational practices. And one of the reasons that many people from China, for example, are interested in taking future learning courses is that they want to understand Western educational practices. And we know this explicitly. I've got a, a good colleague who's based in China and she's doing surveys of people who are taking future learning courses. And one of the reasons they're taking them is that they want to understand how people in the West do education. Um, not so that they can then change Chinese education into Western education, but so they can uh, learn and understand and take the best practices from the West into Chinese education. So I think providing some challenge to people to engage in those sorts of peer reviews or in those sorts of discussions, I think that's quite legitimate to do. But so long as you do it in a sensitive way that respects people's cultural differences. Which one? Okay, great. Very good, actually. Platform and social mm. learners relations and mm. <coughs> Just one thing: on certificate of completion, you can actually purchase or, yeah. you know, or buy one. Yes. Do you have percentage rates of people who actually go down that line, and do they continue on after getting their certificate? Um, so about ten percent of the people who finish a course, get a certificate, so go and buy a certificate, although it varies a lot, so more professional development courses we get higher percentage. And then some of the courses are aligned with master's courses or an undergraduate courses, and we track um, now people coming off future learn courses onto undergraduate or postgraduate courses, and we explicitly ask them, and future learn um, can provide that data to the universities of how many people are being recruited through um, it's obviously quite sensitive data, but one way to look at it is to say that if you've got a master's course that you're teaching on campus with you know, maybe 10 people, 20 people, you put it online, um, and then you can use a MOOC as a recruiting um, way into that, then if you get you know, another 10, 20, 50 people, that's good news uh, if they're paying fees. So, some of the courses, that's the sort of numbers that you're getting. You know, even if you can get 10 or 20 people onto a master's course out of 10,000, that's still good. So um, it's particularly those universities that have got online masters, like Edinburgh University, which is moving all its master's courses, apparently, towards online delivery. Those are the ones that are really going to gain from the MOOCs as recruiting grounds. Yeah. I've got a question with regard to intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of technology behind this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, you need to have scale mm -hmm. and, I guess, resources or whatever yeah. to develop it. And the barriers to entry are mm -hmm. quite large. Is the, do you have any concerns with regard to uh, commercial, commercial providers patenting or copywriting or whatever the, the key technologies and therefore excluding or monopolizing the, the kind of the platform? Um, so, I mean, one of the things is that... Uh, Commercial providers obviously can get into this space. They could have got into this space for the last 10 years of providing free courses, and they haven't for various <coughs> reasons. It's not that easy if you're a publishing company like Pearson's, for example, to produce a successful massive scale um, online learning operation. It's not just a matter of having the platform, but you've got to have all the partners as well willing to contribute. And you know, down at the bottom of it, academics are giving up their, uh, their labor or um, you're getting academic input. Um, into MOOC courses um, as, as a partnership. Now, it's, I think it's harder for commercial, purely commercial companies to get that partnership. So it's not just a matter of building the platform. You've also got to have the partnership. Good thing is that there's a variety of different platforms. You've got Open edX, for example, which is an open platform. And there are universities now that are starting to use Open edX and forming consortia. And one of the things I don't, don't quite understand is why there haven't been more consortia that are using Open edX as um, a shared MOOC platform. Um, so FutureLearn, is a, in terms of its technology, it's a closed platform. And that was a decision that the OU made, for right or wrong, um, way back at the beginning. But the content is all open. Um, and it's um, becoming, in, one of the things we're doing with the FutureLearn content is making it uh, searchable from the web now, so that you can search uh, using Google search terms for individual items um, of content on the platform. And also all of the, interestingly, the learners' comments 
they are all published under a Creative Commons license. So the learners own the rights to their comments. Um, so the learners own the right to the material that they contribute. So we've been looking at um, openness in terms of the, the content, but the platform itself is a, a proprietary platform. And one of the reasons for that is Future Learn is now starting to develop closed in-house courses for companies, uh, which are paid for courses, and we're using that platform um, to uh, develop a suite of courses that bring in revenue to Future Learn, which you don't know about because they are in-house courses for companies. So Future Learn is trying to get into that market. And because we've got the benefit of testing the course on a million people now, then we've been able to do some rapid innovation so that now as we've got the courses for the companies, we've learned quite a lot about how to design successful courses. I'm going to have to stop yeah. on that note. Right. Uh, Mike is uh, mm -hmm. going to be here for most of the day mm -hmm. in actual fact. It's yeah. great when a keynote will do that. So you'll have mm -hmm. some opportunities over the morning tea and lunch time to continue. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Mike. If I could just ask people to join with me and uh, <laughs>